Hey, my name is Kiri. I'm not a doctor. I just love to learn and research. And all of this info is available in the links below so you can look into it all yourself. Okay, let's begin. There's a lot of information flying around about COVID-19 and a lot of people making it a political issue, and there has been a lot of name-calling. I wanted to talk about some basic scientific facts. This is about health. Your health. My health. The health of the people you love, and the health of people you may never meet. First, I want to talk about the two names we've been kind of using interchangeably as a society. Coronavirus and COVID-19. Coronavirus refers to a type of virus. In the same way that influenza virus refers to a virus family, neither of these are referring to a specific strain. Coronaviruses derive their name from the fact that under electron microscopic examination, each viron is surrounded by a corona, or halo. This is due to the presence of viral spike peplomers emanating from each proteinaceous envelope. See all those little spiky things? That's the corona, also known as the S protein. Those S proteins are essentially the keys that the virus uses to enter host cells. The S protein binds to a receptor called an angiotensin, converting enzyme 2 to hack its way into a host cell. It's pretty cool if it wasn't kind of terrifying. Human coronaviruses were first identified in the mid-1960s. Currently, there are about seven that can affect people and the four commonly contracted are these guys. Which probably doesn't mean a lot to most folks, but to give you a rough idea, two of those viruses are causes of the common cold and can cause reinfections throughout life. These viruses account for four to 15% of acute respiratory diseases. While they can still cause severe issues, it's rare. These are the common ones we know pretty well how to take care of with folks. Then there are some coronaviruses that infect animals evolve, and then make people sick, thus becoming a new human coronavirus, like these three. Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, or as you probably know it, SARS. There was an outbreak about 2003. It was a bit scary, but we were more prepared for it, and worldwide, only 774 people died from it, which feels uncomfortable and heartless to describe nearly a thousand deaths as only, but especially looking at our numbers today. With SARS, the US had only eight known cases, which were isolated quickly, and each person infected had traveled through infected regions, all of whom recovered. The most recent pandemic we had prior to our current one was the H1N1 virus, or swine flu. Now, influenza viruses and coronaviruses have some respiratory similarities, but none of these viruses are the same by any means. So there are quite a few variables between then and now. Still, let's look at some numbers, as this was the last global pandemic. There were 60.8 million US cases, with a death rate of only 0.02%, which ended up being about 12,469 people between the year 2009 and 2010. The virus in the 2009 pandemic is considered to be quite different from the typical H1N1 viruses that were circulating at the time. Dubbed H1N1 PDM09, very few young people had existing immunity to it, but about one third of people over 60 years of age had antibodies against it, probably from exposure to other older H1N1 viruses at some time in their lives. The CDC estimated that somewhere between 151,000 to 575,000 people worldwide died from the swine flu virus infection during the first year the virus circulated. Globally, 80% of swine flu virus-related deaths were estimated to have occurred in people younger than 65 years of age. This differs greatly from typical seasonal influenza epidemics during which about 70% to 90% of deaths are estimated to occur in people 65 years and older. There are a lot of differences of how things were handled in 2009 versus now. And a big one is how the government reacted. In response to H1N1, the United States mounted a complex, multifaceted, and long-term response to the pandemic. 
summarized in a link below that if you have time, I hope you give it a good read. It's dry, but enlightening. So let's talk about that third coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2. That's what we're looking at right now. Please bear in mind that while it's related genetically to SARS as we knew it in 2003, while their names are similar, one did not mutate from the other. They're just respiratory diseases that come from a coronavirus. On February 11th, 2020, the World Health Organization announced an official name for the disease first identified in Wuhan, China in 2019. The new name of this disease is Coronavirus Disease 2019, abbreviated as COVID-19. In COVID-19, CO stands for Corona, V for virus, and D for disease. Formerly, this disease was referred to as 2019 Novel Coronavirus, or 2019-N-CoV. So that's why it's called COVID-19. It's not the 19th iteration of COVID. I know you knew that, but that bit of misinformation really irked me in particular when I heard it. Since its first reported detection in December 2019, to me recording this video, we have had 5.5 million cases globally. Of those cases, a little over half are active and infected. Of those still infected right now, about 97 to 98% are in mild condition, with only 2 to 3% in serious or critical condition, a rough estimate of about 53,000 people. Of those closed cases, 87% recovered or were discharged, healthy enough to recover at home, which means right now, of those closed cases, 13% have died. When I first did this research a few weeks ago, that was at 21%. I know this is grim, but I'm telling you this to give you some hope. That percentage has gone down nearly 10%. So for my fellow USA residents, I have an uncomfortable visual. If you go and look at all these trackers, we are leading in a way that is frankly not something we want to have a lead in. And we are leading by a lot. Admittedly, part of this is definitely a result by the fact that we are a very large country. But our behavior is also a large factor in this. And for a brief moment, this might seem slightly political, but I assure you my only intention here is to separate the pandemic from political agenda. As the leading country in cases and deaths, we are not in a situation where we can reopen the country. Those numbers are scary now, but they will get scarier if we aren't careful. Those death counts are more than just numbers to me, to the people I love. Friends have lost mothers, fathers, aunts, and that's only the people I personally know. At the time of recording this, we have almost already hit 100,000 dead in the US alone. What is terrifying is that there are no real provisions in place to help people in these times. So we see people thinking that they have to choose between endangering spiking infection rate and paying rent and bills. And this should not be a choice people have to make. And some shrug this off by convincing themselves that the pandemic is not a big deal. But it is. If your governor is still keeping your state closed, it's not because he hates you or because he wants to kill your business or the economy. It's because the facts we're looking at right now are genuinely terrifying. Okay, speaking of the facts, let's get back to them. Masks. I've seen a lot of information going around that your mask is not gonna protect you. And that is half correct. Your mask is not going to really protect you, but it's not there to protect you. It's there to protect others from you. The masks they're wearing are there to protect you. See, when we breathe or talk or sneeze, all those germs carried in our spit and mucus and breath stop short. When infected folk wear masks, it significantly reduces the risk of spreading airborne diseases. In fact, there's a very helpful article linked below to a 2020 study at the University of Maryland. Now, people may argue they don't need masks because they aren't infected, but the sad matter is, you don't actually know. You could be asymptomatic. Many people have been asymptomatic and still carried the virus. And while Angelique and I were tested on Friday and our tests came back negative, we still wear masks because there could still be a chance we might have picked up something right after our test, around our apartment complex even. Yes, we social distance, we take all the precautions, but you can't know. We can only be careful for those around us. The problem with masks, however, is it does require everyone to wear one for this method to be effective, as well as follow hand cleansing directives and be careful about what they touch, where they go, etc. Yes, 
It's frustrating. I have horrible cabin fever. I really miss just being outside and goodness knows I miss seeing my friends. But this is also for the greater good. It is not, however, an infringement on your rights. I've seen a lot of videos of people complaining that being told that you have to wear a mask to shop somewhere or enter a building is a violation of their First Amendment rights. It is not. Here's what the First Amendment says. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. A private establishment isn't addressed at all in this statement. This is about Congress making laws. This is why prior to COVID-19, a private establishment can say, no shoes, no shirt, no service, or simply, we have the right to deny service to anyone. I know it's scary, and I know it's heckin' inconvenient, but staying at home and social distancing and wearing masks when we do have to go out is not only scientifically proven to help, but in conjunction with testing, tracking infection, and isolating infection to care for it is the only way we're going to get to a place where COVID-19 isn't the global threat it is today. If we had hospital beds and a respirator for every person in this country, and in every country, it might be different, but we don't. So flattening the curve is extremely important. Where this disease becomes even more deadly is when our hospitals are overwhelmed and unable to help the people who need it. It's not just hype, it's science. And again, you can find all the links below with the information I've said today. And I highly, highly encourage you to go look through these sites and other reputable ones like it and find evidence for yourself. Research, it gives you power. Now for footage of Angelique and I going to a drive through test in LA County so you can know what it's like. We are all ooh, in a yellow submarine. I'm gonna blur that guy out. Yeah. We have our specimen bags. It's very exciting. They're very nice, they're very sweet. And if you are one of the people running anything like this, thank you so much. Thank you. You are amazing. Holy cow. Oh. Yeah, and it, feel, it feels so weird seeing this because I, I love horror movies and I, I watch Pandemic. She made us so watch Contagion. And Outbreak. And Outbreak. <laughs> I love those movies. They're the scariest movies I've ever seen. So actually seeing this, I'm We're like, this so is so right real. Now. This is so surreal. All right, we've done it. I gagged a little on the Q-tip because that's going in the back of the throat. And now we are putting it in this blue bin, which suspiciously looks like a trash can, but is in fact not. Woohoo! And that's it. We got our test. That was and so that quick. Took about max 10 minutes. Yeah, that was not so even. fast. Give your city's data. Yes. If your city is, if your city is doing tests for asymptomatic people and you can get tested, please go do so. Give, give our lovely medical scientists and lovely people bio data so they can actually like fi help figure this stuff out is good. Because knowing where the virus is not can be just as beneficial as knowing where it is. So if our area starts getting it they'll know when they got it exactly. so if our tests come back negative and then people we, it comes back positive with people in our area they'll know around when it came and from whom it helps with tracking and yes. tracking in regards to an infectious disease is so important there is optimism to be found we can recover from this h1n1 hit us hard even though we were very prepared for it but now we have vaccines and treatment, and those vaccines are in the same circulation as any other flu vaccine. Fatality is far more rare, and we know how to treat it. COVID-19 will eventually be the same, but it needs our help. We just have to make sure we're not overwhelming our support network. Thank you so much for watching. Keep on the windy side of care, stay safe, and most importantly, stay curious.